that the space that Palestinians are living in is shrinking. So the idea is confine the Palestinians into as small a space as possible, take as much land of, as possible. Diana Butu is a Palestinian human rights lawyer, former Birzeit University professor, and former legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiation team. Butu received her law degree from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, in Canada, and a master's of law from Stanford University. She is currently working as a lawyer on land confiscation, home demolitions, and revocation of residency. Butu has appeared on numerous news and analysis programs speaking on refugee rights. The following presentation, given at the 2010 Convention of al Auda, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition, is entitled Palestinian Refugee Rights, the Palestinian Political Process, and the So-Called Negotiations. The title of the talk, that what I was asked to speak about, was the negotiations process and what's gone on during the peace process, the so-called peace process. And um, you know, I've given talks on this, on this issue many, many, many times in the past, but this is the first time that I'm actually really nervous about it, um, really nervous to the point where I was kind of thinking, what do I say? What do, what do I say that they, ha- that they don't already know? Um, what is it that, that will be new and, and, and will change things? And I realized that there is nothing new, and so I'm going to talk about why, the, why it is that there's nothing new. I know that for a lot of people um, with the Obama administration, with the new um, changing circumstances in the West Bank, that people actually believe that there is something different that is going around, that's going to happen this time around. And, and what I want to talk about today is how it's really nothing different that's happening this time around, and instead show um, through a series of slides why, why it is that nothing different is happening this time around. I had to, um, I wanted to, I ended up adapting my presentation in light of our conversation with Norman Finkelstein yesterday, so forgive me if it's if it's perhaps not as smooth as uh, as it should be, um, and I'm going to try to as much as possible leave questions open. So I want to first go through the issue of negotiations and what it was believed that negotiations were going to attain, and why that it was believed uh, that negotiations were going to attain this and. It, it's not it's not so concrete or discreet to look back at the period of 1990 or 1991 or 92 or 93, but it goes all the way back back to the 70s. And what I mean by why I mean by it goes back to the 70s is that after uh, Israel's military occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip began in 1967, there was this there was a fundamental shift away from this, from the belief that Palestinian refugees should be returning to their homes. This is on the part of the PLO. And instead, there was a shift in belief that uh, rather than focusing on al Audi, rather than focusing on the return of refugees, uh, the, re- the undoing of 1948, that instead it became an accommodation of current circumstances, an accommodation of Israel's presence, an accommodation to Zionism with the viewpoint being that rather than focusing on the return of refugees to, to, to their homes, that the focus now became on statehood. And with it, uh, all the trappings of statehood. So you get to you know, hold up a flag. You get to have a little postage stamp. You get to collect the garbage. Um, you get to uh, say that you control your own borders. You get to do whatever, and national anthems, and so on and so forth. And it is this very trap that, uh, that the PLO and, and later the Palestinian Authority entered into that has led us down this path, a path that I think that the only way we can get out of is if we redirect and reshape and reframe our mode of thinking. So for, you know, when the negotiations process started in, uh, in the 1990s, you know, many people, there's been many, con- I'm going to step back for a second. After the negotiations uh, process ended in the year 2000, and currently, as we're hearing more and more talk of new negotiations, and in fact, today I, I'm assuming that we're going to get a rubber stamping on the part of the Arab League to restart uh, what they call proximity talks. Um, and with it, with the restarting of, of these negotiations, I think it becomes important to step back and ask ourselves, 
why is it did the, that the negotiations failed? And, and you'll see a lot of commentary on the question of why it is that the negotiations failed. In my view, the negotiations didn't fail at all. It was quite the opposite. The negotiations very much succeeded. They succeeded in allowing Israel to implement its long-term strategy against the Palestinians. So don't, get, don't mistake me. The negotiations uh, did not fail from the viewpoint of Israel. They actually succeeded because it ended up being a one, a, yet another tool that Israel uses in its long-term strategy of trying to confine the Palestinians into as small of a space as possible take as much of land of their land as possible, while all the while pretending that uh, there are sort of talks and a partner and uh, you know negotiations and if only and if only and if only. So really at the essence, the negotiations process, again, don't, don't misquote me, the negotiations process did not fail from the standpoint of the Israelis. It was a process that was put into place and designed precisely to carry out and implement Israel's long-term strategy. When the process began, um, Israel had declared that it had wanted a few things out of the, out of the so-called peace process. And it was the few things that it ended up getting. The first was that it declared that they wanted to have better international relations with the rest of the world. And you might recall that at the time, Israel was um, being viewed, and still is, but it was different at those, th that point in time. It was being isolated and ostracized by a number of different countries. With the start of the negotiations process, Israel managed through, our, through Palestinian help, of course, to get an additional 34 countries to sign on to diplomatic relations with Israel. So rather than being ostracized, being ostracized for the fact that it's been carrying out an occupation for all of these years, ostracized for the fact that it's ethnically cleansed 75% of the Palestinian uh, population, instead it ended up being embraced by the international community with 34 countries signing on to it. The second demand that Israel had, which was largely, uh, which it largely um, achieved, was that it wanted to have better security, and indeed it did. And during the period of um, 1993 to the year 2000, the seven years of the negotiations process, Israel actually had the most secure years of its history. With, with 1999 in particular being the most secure year that Israel ever had. Now this was not the result of, uh, of better implementation of, of security measures, as Israel would claim, on its part, but simply for one reason, which is that it managed to transform the Palestinian people, for, for a people under whom, uh, who are living under Israeli military occupation, it managed to transform them and their leadership into the security subcontractor for the, for the state of Israel. So rather than, uh, ha rather than resisting, which is a right uh, that is enshrined under international law, we ended up being the only population in the history of mankind that was forced to provide security and, and safety for our very oppressor and occupier. And that is why Israel had the most successful years of it, the most secure years of its history. So those were the two things that Israel wanted. It wanted better diplomatic relations, it wanted um, better security, and it got both of them. But the thing that it ended up getting, which was even more important to Israel, of better diplomatic relations and better security, was the continued land grab. And it's that continued land grab that I'm going to talk a little bit about now. So the first slide that we're looking at, and I'm going to, I'm, most of these slides are going to focus on the West Bank and then the Gaza Strip, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Palestinians, like myself, who are citizens of, uh, of the state of Israel. Um, this first slide that you're going to see is, you know, a very typical slide of, of the West Bank with all of the cities that are demarcated on it. And here you've got... You know, your very typical Palestinian areas of Palestinian built-up areas um, sort of showing up on the map, the population and figures and so on and so forth. 
And here you've got the Israeli settlements that are showing up. Now, you know, yesterday when Norman Finkelstein was talking, he, he mentioned something that was very important. He said the settlements themselves only comprise about 1% to 2% of the West Bank. He's actually right on that. He's, he's actually factually right on, on this particular port, point. But you can see that the way that the settlements were built and have been built and continue to be built, it's not so easy, as Norman Finkelstein said yesterday, to simply just evacuate out 80% of the settlers and put them to 60% of the, the settlements. And here we've got the Israeli closed areas and military bases. Now, this particular slide I always feel is very important for one reason, which is it doesn't have any of the closures marked on it. It doesn't have any of the checkpoints that are marked on it. It doesn't have any of the roads that are marked on it, anything like that. Nothing on, on that. But yet, anybody who even has a little bit of a sense of economy and how economies move, just looking at that alone, you can see that the solution that is being pushed forward, that of an economic solution, is one that's simply not going to work. It never will work. It never has worked. never will work. That even when you have the removal of, of uh, checkpoints, which is what a lot of the members of the Palestinian Authority are now calling for, even when you do that, even if you simply remove all of the checkpoints, you're still faced with a situation like this, in which the vast majority of the West Bank is no longer in Palestinian hands or in Palestinian control. All right, so here we go to Oslo. And this is what happened during Oslo. So the fundamental thing, I, I told you, the first thing that Israel wanted was they wanted diplomatic, um, they wanted better diplomatic relations, which they got. The second thing that they wanted is they wanted better security, which they ended up getting. The third thing that Israel wanted, and this is the big prize that Israel wanted, is it wanted to be able to justify its separation of the people from their land. And so the way that they did it is very simple. You classify areas into Palestinian areas and Israeli areas, with Area A and Area B, those two areas that are highlighted there, being the so-called Palestinian areas, where you have a pseudo-Palestinian government coming to pseudo-control the, the pseudo-area. Um, and then all around, and then you create the parity, so that just as there's a uh, Israeli government, there's also a Palestinian government. Just as there's an Israeli prime minister, there's a Palestinian prime minister. Just as there is an Israeli president, there's a Palestinian president. Unfortunately, when it comes to Palestinians, we actually have two prime ministers, one president. We had a coup without really having a state. And, you know, the rest is history, so to speak. Anyway, so, <laughs> so the, whole, the point of it was trying to separate Palestinians from their land. And you can see very clearly that this was the beginning basis of how to separate people from their land. You do it ethnically. You try to separate ethnically. Add to that the settlements. Now, the interesting thing about the settlements was that during the period of the, of the Oslo process, a time when, as I said, one of the goals that the Palestinian Authority, or the PLO, had at the time was to create statehood and to focus on statehood and to move away from the issue of the right of return. Instead, compromise, give compromise rights for uh, something like this. So compromise the issue of the right of return in order to get statehood. And the fascinating thing with all this, and this is the part that is never really um, clicked for me, is that even during the period of negotiations, even during the period where they were focused exclusively on this concept of statehood and uh, on getting a state, that even during this period, the number of settlements ended up doubling during the period of the year from 1993 to the year 2000. They end up doubling from 200,000 settlers to 400,000 settlers within a seven-year period. It was as though the Oslo Accords gave Israel the green light and just they pushed it and they said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to continue to build and continue to build and continue to build and nobody is going to stop us. And indeed they did. So now what you're looking at is you've got a, the, you've got a situation which there are close to 500,000 settlers that are now living in, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, living in a, in a w w situation of, of more than apartheid, um, in which they control the vast majority of the land. The reason that I wanted to show this slide in particular was in response to something that Norman Finkelstein again said yesterday, which is that his point yesterday in his talk was that he wanted, he believes that there can be, uh, that we need to start, move away from ideology and that we need to focus instead uh, on our supporters as being, it doesn't matter what our supporters um, believe 
ideologically, but we have to ask them the hard questions. Do you believe in home demolitions? Do you support uh, the construction of settlements? Do you support the, um, the confiscation of land? Do you support this? Do you support that? So on and so forth. But one thing, and I, I, this is a little bit unfair to him because he's not here today, but one thing that I tried to allude to yesterday in, in our, in our um, discussion with him was that you're actually focusing on the symptoms when you're focusing on those issues, and you're saying, do, do we support our, uh, this or do you support that? But what he's ignoring is he's focusing on, he's, he's ignoring the disease. The disease, the symptom of, of the, I'm not a doctor, Mustafa is, but the symptom here is, is the construction of settlements. The symptom here is the demol demolition of homes. The symptom here is the confiscation of land. The symptom is um, the, uh, the confining Palestinians into small spaces. The disease is not that. And it's the disease that we need to start focusing on. It, the disease is the viewpoint that, that Israelis have more of a right to live in historic Palestine than the Palestinians do. And in that, in my opinion, is the disease. And that, in my opinion, is the thing that Norman Finkelstein hasn't focused on, which is we have to now start, rather than uh, simply asking the litmus test, do you believe, do you believe, do you believe, do you believe? Instead, we ha actually have to start challenging the ideology, the ideology that believes that, that, uh, that Israelis have more of a right to live in Palestine than the Palestinians do, that settlers and uh, the colonial movement has more of a right to be there than the indigenous Palestinian population. So with all of that, <laughs> you then have, after you put on the settlements, you then got a situation, you've then got the closed air, military areas and the, and the uh, closed military zones. And you can see how during the period of Oslo, and this is current day, these are current day maps, by the way, that the space that Palestinians are living in is shrinking. So the idea is confine the Palestinians into as small a space as possible, take as much land as possible. So again, the tools are home demolitions, land confiscation, so on and so forth. But it's that ideology that hasn't gone away, and it's that ideology that we need to be challenging. Another tool that's used to confiscate land, nature reserves. And this is what we're looking at right now. So the point of all of this is, is that during the period of Oslo, during the period of the negotiations, that Israel's long-term strategy has been and always will be to try to get rid of as many Palestinians as possible, whether it's by getting rid of them, turning them into refugees, or by confining them into as small of a space and taking up their land. This is the long-term strategy, and this is the strategy that need, we need to be fighting. Now, here's, you know, I, I, I love this slide, um, because it actually shows you what's actually happening, you know, it's, it's a, when, when you do something close up. And what you're looking at here is um, you've got, you've got, this is actually satellite imagery, where with a white line there that you see there, that's actually the wall, which you can actually see from above through satellite imagery. Um, what you're looking at first is you're looking at the, the city of Kalkilia, which is the, the city that's um, this round sort of bulbous city to, the, to your left. And this is where um, the wall has gone up. Okay, there's the Palestinian population. Again, the strategy is playing itself out. Confine the Palestinians into as small a space as possible, take as much land. Two Israeli settlements in the area, com combined settler population of maybe 7,000. You've got a Palestinian population of about 50,000 Palestinians. And you can see the fascinating thing is that here, again, here I was part of the team that um, worked on litigating the case of the wall before the International Court of Justice. And this was uh, one of the slides that we actually ended up using, which is it shows you very clearly the link between, between what Israel's long-term strategy is and how it is that it's affecting that long-term strategy. So you see in this slide, you've got um, the two settlements that are that are on uh, that are outside of the wall, and you've got a pal the Palestinian population, which is actually confined and separated inside that wall. Now, again, here's again, again th this is the part where I I, um, I often kind of wonder about um, Israeli uh, statements. Um, you can see that the wall goes around not just the settlement itself, but also around the planned expansion area of that settlement. With the, with the long-term goal, again, being confine the Palestinians into as small a space as possible and take as much land as possible. I think that the major issue that I wanted to focus on here, uh, and I'm sorry it's taken me so long to get to it, is that this time around, with negotiations that are about to start in a week's time, and there will be negotiations starting in a week's time, 
the difference is going to be absolutely zero. Um, with the exception, with one exception, which is what they actually call the talks. Between the period of 1993 to 2000, they called them negotiations. This time around, they're calling it proximity talks. I don't really know what a proximity talk is. Like, it just means that one person is close to the other and they're not really talking, there's a mediator. I'm not really quite sure what that whole thing means. Um, but the same problem is going to happen that happened during the period of 1993 to the year 2000, which is a problem that I faced during that period, which was that the, between the period of 1993 to the year 2000, I, for one, and I can't speak about anybody else, but I, for one, checked out. And the reason that I checked out was that I was reading the New York Times, and I was reading the Washington Post, and I was reading the Wall Street Journal. And what was important to me at the time between those years was um, finishing law school and, uh, and becoming a lawyer. I don't know why that was so important to me, but it was. And so what mattered to me when I read the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and the New York Times was seeing whether there was a handshake, whether there was a meeting. It didn't really matter to me what was coming out of the meeting, but I felt that things were good. I felt that things were moving in the right direction. This time around, we're going to continue to see the same reporting. It's going to be um, a little bit different. It's going to continue to be like, did he wink or did he blink? Did he nudge or did he elbow? Uh, did he whatever? Did, was he sending a message? Is he not sending a message? But that's going to be the, the, the only difference, is that in terms of the substance, the substance is going to continue to be the same, which is that, first, on the issue of land, Israel has never and will never recognize or acknowledge um, the Palestinian right to exist in their homeland. It has never happened. It will never happen unless we do something about it, which I'll talk about in a second. The second thing is that, somewhat similar to what Norman Finkelstein said yesterday, is that there's going to continue to, to be demands on Palestinians to even uh, concede even further on their, on their own territory, um, something that, that we've seen in the past and will continue to see in the future. So even if you are somebody who believes in the two-state solution, ideologically believes in the two-state solution, the, the two-state solution, as they would like to put it, um, is not going to be one that is based on the 1967 borders or even based on the 1947 partition plan, but instead is going to be based on something that is practical and something that's doable and something that we can this and we can that. Uh, with with the idea being that, that as Israel continues to negotiate and puts a, head, a gun to the head of the Palestinians, they're going to continue to demand more and more and more concessions from the Palestinians, saying that unless you actually ex uh, accept and make these huge concessions, we are not going to stop the, the human rights abuses and the atrocities that we're committing in, in uh, the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, and indeed to the Palestinians who are citizens of Israel and to refugees. Uh, that's the, the next thing. The third thing is Jerusalem. One of the most fascinating things that's happened with Jerusalem is that as uh, the peace process continued and uh, as now the, the so-called proximity talks are about to launch, half of all of the land confiscation orders that we're now receiving in the, in the West Bank, more than, about half of them are actually in the area of East Jerusalem. More than half of the home demolition orders that are taking place now in the West Bank in Area C um, and, uh, and in other parts of the West Bank, more than half of them are now coming from the area of Jerusalem, of East Jerusalem. In terms of the, um, the, uh, the issue of um, building, fewer than 128 permits were issued last year to Palestinians living in East Jerusalem to be able to build their homes. This is a crime. When you hear of a population that is 200,000 strong, and growing. To only get 128 uh, permits, housing construction permits, during that year, at the same time when West Jerusalem got more than 8,000 construction permits, it shows you what the long-term strategy is. And do these, uh, uh, and again, the, po the point is really confine and try to get rid of as many Palestinians as possible. Confine them, make life so difficult that they eventually leave. And that policy is not going to change. And finally, and I think the most important thing when it comes to the negotiations, is that there has never been, and there will never be, provided that uh, the current configuration is in place, any recognition that Palestinians have a right to return to their homes, period. This is something on the part of Israel. 
Unfortunately, that same, that same issue is also taking place within the PLO and within the Palestinian Authority. If you, if you read carefully, and words are very, very careful, if you read very carefully, what, what you see in every single um, peace plan, if they want to call it that, every peace plan that has been put forward on the table over the course of the past decade pretty much takes the same shape and form. Oh, you know, some sort of a compromise on territory so that you get somewhat of the 67 borders, somewhat of a compromise so that there's a land swap, somewhat of a compromise when it comes to East Jerusalem. But the fascinating thing, and this is something that Palestinian, the, the so-called Palestinian leadership and the negotiators are saying, and this is why words are important, is they're not talking about the right of return. Instead, they talk about things called just solutions. Solution does not equal rights. And this is the most important thing that I think we need to be aware of. Now, all of this is to say that um, this is all this is to say that when it comes to the issue of negotiations, again, in, in to many of us, the negotiations failed. But we shouldn't be viewing it as a failure of the negotiations, but we, we should be viewing it as, as a success of Israel's project in order to try to put forward and promote uh, negotiations. And this is why it becomes very alarming when we ourselves begin to use the language of negotiations and begin to believe in the process of negotiations. The process of negotiations is a process that has been very successful. It's been very, very successful for Israel. Now, with that, um, I want to talk just for a few seconds about how it is that we move forward and what it is that we uh, collectively can do. My, uh, the, my, pa my parents, I'm a refugee. Um, my father was displaced in 1948. Uh, but what he didn't mention was that not only was my father displaced in 1948, but he didn't just flee to Nazareth in 1948. They, he, they actually have quite an interesting story, um, which will relate to what I want to talk about now, which is that in 1948, my grandmother and grandfather fled, uh, along with, at the time, they had nine children. They ended up doubling that by the time, by uh, nine years later. <laughs> so it ended up being a very, very large family that I come from. But in 1948, they fled. And they fled not just from al Mjedel to Nazareth, but they then fled from, from Nazareth up to Lebanon. And then from Lebanon, they went to Syria. And from Syria, they went to Jordan. And then from Jordan, they became infiltrators, just like there's now this new law of infiltration. Um, it's very interesting how history repeats itself. So they infiltrated back, uh, so-called infiltrated back in 1950. My grandmother recently passed away, and uh, it was, which was very hard and very emotional for me. But just before she passed away, I uh, had a really wonderful opportunity. She, she died at the age of 97. She was uh, grandmother to, I think it's 73 children, great-grandmother to 198, and great-great-grandmother to 13. So she was uh, a remarkable, remarkable woman. But one of the things that she ended up saying to me um, before she passed away, she was a, a very feisty woman, was I asked her, I said, you know, Grandma, why did you, why did you flee in 1948? And these are the stories I think are very important because we, we never have this conversation as families. We never really talk to one another about what's happened in history and why and what they were thinking, what her dreams were and what have you and so on. And I had the opportunity, I asked her, I said, why did you flee in 1948? And she said, we didn't flee. I was like, well, what do you mean you didn't flee? She said, we were waiting for the Iraqi army. Jeish okay. al-Fawzi, uh, waiting for the Iraqi army. Now, anybody who's read history, they know that they sort of stopped at the West Bank just in order to protect their little protectorate and what have you. But, but this was the, the, what she was told, is that they were not fleeing. They were just going to be leaving because they were waiting for the Iraqi army. And they waited for the Iraqi army for, for a period of about two years. For, for, well, it gets better. The story gets better. So they waited for the Iraqi army for a period of about two years. And in 1950, when she decided, and she was the one who decided, it wasn't my grandfather, it was her. She was the one who decided. 1950, she decided that she was going to go back, and she was going to go back to, uh, to Palestine. They, she, they didn't know that al was had been taken over at this point in time. When she decided to go back, I asked her, I said, well, why did you decide to go back? And she said a very important thing, which has stayed with me forever, which is, I realized that the Iraqi army was not coming. Okay. And so this is the point, is that we have been waiting for far too long for the Iraqi army to show up. 
We've been waiting. We put our faith in, in, a, in a leadership that has proven that, it's, that it, it cannot lead. We've put our faith in a leadership that has proven that it is corrupt and that it's more interested in maintaining the trappings of power and continuing to implement Israeli strategy. We've put our faith in the U.S. administration, believing that somehow, if only Americans knew a little bit more about us, that, uh, that they will somehow change and that the U.S. administration will change and that U.S. policy will change. We've been waiting for the Iraqi army for far too long. And it's time for us to now no longer wait for the Iraqi army. And it's time for us to actually start doing things just in the same way that my grandmother in 1950 decided, despite everything, with at that point in time now 11 children, no longer nine, uh, to go back to Palestine. She was no longer going to wait for the Iraqi army. And this is what we, it's now our duty to do this as well. We cannot wait for the Iraqi army any longer. We have to take matters into our own hands. So the question becomes, what is it that we do? There's a few things that I think that we need to focus on. First is um, we need to focus on the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. We need to focus on this. Yes, thank you. <laughs> we need to focus on BDS for, uh, and you know, I don't want people to say, oh, it's not going to do anything. It won't work. It won't this. It doesn't. It will work. It will work. It will work. And even if it doesn't work, at least we tried. And it will work. It will work. Now, the reason we need to focus on, on boycott, divestment, sanctions, and I know I'm speaking to an audience of people who are sympathetic, is that for far too long, um, Israel's just gotten away with matters. They've gotten away with murder. Literally, they've gotten away with murder. And the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is the only thing that is going to try to put a stop to Israel in terms of not being able to get away with murder any longer. The second thing, and I think this is also a very important thing, is we need to start focusing on our ability, and Palestinian ability, to stay in Palestine. If you believe that the long-term strategy of Israel is to try to get rid of as many Palestinians as possible and take as much land of, as, of theirs as possible, then the only response that you can have to that is to make sure that Palestinians actually remain in their land. That's it. So what, what I mean by that is there are a lot of projects that focus on Sumud. These are the projects that we need to start focusing on now. These are the projects where we need to start. Palestinians don't need more ambulances. Really, they don't. What we need is we need strategies that ensure that Palestinians actually remain on their land, on the ground. That's the second thing. And with that, I think that it becomes crucially important that we stop focusing on the divisions that are taking place within our own community. And there are plenty of divisions that are in, within our own community. I, I don't care about Hamas. I don't care about Fatah. I don't care about all of the petty politics. To me, it goes back to something that um, Mustafa, Mustafa actually once said, which is, all of this is a group of bald men fighting over a comb, really. <laughs> and that's what it is. So <laughs> it doesn't matter to me who's in charge or why they're in charge, but what matters to me is whether any of these organizations have as their primary goal making sure that Palestinians remain on their land. And the third, and I think one of the, uh, the, the next strategy that I think we need to start employing is that something that Jess referred to, uh, Jess spoke about yesterday, which is holding people accountable and trying to make sure that Israeli leaders get held accountable. One of the most fascinating things that has happened as a result of the Gaza massacre is that Israelis can no longer travel. They are afraid to travel. The Israeli leaders are afraid to go to, to the UK. They're afraid to go to other countries within Europe. And it's starting, it's a growing movement now that I want to continue to, that I want to continue to see, which is I want to make sure that it's not just Israeli leaders that are held to account, but that, it's, it, that it, it is the Israeli people that are now held to account. I don't like this fiction of separating the people from the leadership because I personally believe that the only way that people will be held accountable is if the actual people are now beginning to be held accountable for the actions of, 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 uh, of the government. That's uh, one of the next things. In addition to that, I also believe that there's a lot of um, legal strategies that we can be employing on this, on this matter. Uh, you know, I, I don't 
I'm not a lawyer who believes that law is just sort of developed out of a vacuum. I really understand the power dynamics that go into development of law. But I think that as a whole, we're a growing community. We're getting stronger. We're getting louder. Ten years ago, there weren't this many people in the room. In two, years, two more years' time, this room will be double the size it is. It will be double the size that it is. And so because of that, our voices are becoming louder, they're becoming stronger, and we need to start focusing on other mechanisms to ensure louder. The final thing that I think is one of the most important strategies that we need to focus on is that if you look at one of the elements that has divided us as a community, um, whether and I'm not talking about factionally, but I'm talking about as a community, has been this debate of um, Two state, one state, uh, Hamas, Fatah, so on and so forth. I think that we're wrongly placed, at, 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 we are misplaced at focusing on that as, as being the primary dividing point. That is not to me the primary dividing point. The primary issue for me is do you believe that Palestinians have the right to return? That's it. Do you believe that Palestinians have, have the right to live in their homeland? That's it. It doesn't matter to me, and it's, it's never been a question, I've never been a person who's believed that statehood or the concept of statehood, whether it's two states or one, will be, the, will be something that actually enshrines people's human rights. It never has in the history of mankind. It never will in the history of mankind. History, states are actually oppressors of human rights. They are not elements that uphold human rights. Instead, we need to start focusing on the concept of al -Aude. And if we focus on the concept of al-Aude as a community, I think that we will be able to overcome this long-term strategy that Israel has, whether it's a strategy that Israel has, whether it's a strategy that the Palestinian Authority has bought into, or whether it's a strategy that has been used to divide us as a community. We need to start focusing on our unity, and our unity is al-Aude. So with that, I want to thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you.